So in this first part of the Hanabukas uh, auction of Neapolitan dolls, which we've entitled the doll as theater based upon their presentation, um, I tried to come up with a way, a, a theme, or to try to show you uh, different categories of dolls. And there's so many that I decided, well, there's only one theme I can come up with. I want to show you some of my favorites. There are hundreds more, but this will give you an idea of how wonderful these dolls are. As you're looking at them, I want you to try to remember a couple things. Number one, as I, as I looked at them, I, found, I definitely found similarities in faces. I found things that had like, always like common types of sculpture or common types of look, but every one is different. Every one was different. And now let's look at them and see one of them. One of the things that came to me was how many of the dolls had sculpted hair and sculpted coif on there, or, or a, a scarf or a hat or something like that. I love this particular lady. And if, if you're looking at our catalog later that we produce, you're going to see that for so many of the dolls, we have done multiple views of their face because when you come at them from different angles, each part of the face is different and it's so dramatic. Um, as you were looking at the scenes before, for example, you, could, you would see people interacting, but then if you turned around and would look at them from a different angle, they would be totally different. She has this wonderful white um, molded and painted scarf around her head. She has a very generous bosom, which you will find um, on many of the Neapolitan women. They don't all, but some do. And so I found her to be very, very nice. Their eyes are enamel. Um, and that's almost uniform across the board. Very, very rarely do you find one that has painted eyes, but they have enamel eyes, and they have their poseable armature bodies. And then here is another one who has a very lovely little white cap. And again, if you're noticing on here, the various regional costumes that they're all wearing and I'm going to turn her around, and I hope the camera's picking up their faces and the details of the hats. It's just absolutely wonderful on here. I'm going to lean her back a little so maybe the camera could get her face better. I have found that in this, <clears throat> if, you, if you end up owning some and you have them in your home, See, their arms are very poseable. You can put them however you would like to. But to me, they always look better if you can display them holding, holding a piece. One of, the people, one of the things people said, well, great, you showed all these wonderful scenes, but I don't have room for a scene like that in my home, so why, why would I have these dolls? Well, you don't have to have them in a scene. For example, I think two or three together with a little accessory or something, a little basket of fruit in front of them. It's a wonderful little vignette. That's all you need. You do not need to create the entire village. Look at this wonderful woman. First of all, what an extraordinary face. And then her molded painted cap. And I'm doing their faces slowly because I want you to see them from every angle. Remember, you could pose the body as you wished. And I should call your attention to the actual carving of the hands and feet, too, which are so very, very expressive. They're made to be dynamic and animated and to bring a lively look. Very beautiful one. And then this lady has a green molded cap. And she has, she's very early in the catalog because she is definitely one of my favorites. I look at that face. That is a stunning face. Very, very wonderful sculpting of her hands. Very beautiful painting. And the rarity feature of this cap. And doesn't this remind you of uh, the German bisque dolls that were being made in the 1870s and 80s of the ladies with sculpted hair and sculpted caps? And then even later on, doesn't it remind you of the Heubach, Gebruder Heubach children that were made with sculpted caps? Traditions continue. She has a really nice molded bosom there as well. Beautiful doll, and they're a wonderful original um, preserved folklore costume, which is a whole field in itself that needs to be explored more to identify uh, what the particular costumes are. 
But while you're up here in the table, I'm just going to show you a few more that I brought up here again, because as I said, I'm showing you some of my favorites. We have these two are posed together in a photograph in the catalog, and it's one of my um, favorite favorite photographs and it's almost like look them in the scene now tell me the story that goes with them because this is a story that's that is the whole point of these dolls is their is their reality their their livelihood the artists who did this who 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 commissioned so were commissioned to do some of these pieces were also the fine artists of their time san martino um, and others and they never signed their, the pieces with their name, and we're going to come to that in a little bit. I won't say never, I'll say there is very little evidence that they have. But it is known that they did design these pieces. Why didn't they? It's not any different than Carrier Belleurs, who did the Bebe Triste for Emile Jumeau, but he never signed his name to that because he was a fine artist. He didn't do dolls. And the same with the theatrical dolls of the Neapolitans. Um, they, they were designed by very, very famous artists but they did not attribute their name to them because this was considered playful art. This was not the serious stuff. And, but the, we, so now 200 years later, get the benefit of their artistry in being able to own these wonderful pieces. And let me turn them around. I love his costume. Absolutely wonderfully made. I hope you're able to see. Again, we're going to see most of these in the catalog. You'll see them in multiple shots. Okay, this just happens to be one of my favorite, where they're being sold individually, but one of my favorite little groupings in the entire catalog is this little boy and his dog. And look at this. Now, for those of you who only collect little dolls, there are many of these characters, and I think it's extraordinary. And when you saw the village scene before, where they were all in the marketplace, he was there in the marketplace, with his dog and it fits in so you have people of all different sizes ages men women old young and this is a wonderful little boy one of the th things that people have not paid that much attention to in years past is that animals figured very very heavily in the neapolitan scene there were dogs there were cows there were lambs there were goats um, and there are many of them in this collection they're made of terracotta and made of carved wood and they're extraordinary. Look at this guy with his original leather collar on him. And he, how would you not want to have him and this little boy? Just wonderful. Just imagine those. If you don't want a whole collection of Neapolitans, you just have these little pair under a glass dome. They'd be so beautiful. And this fellow, okay, I, well, I'm just kind of in love with him. That's all there is to it. I want you to realize this is not cloth. This is a sculpted hat, and it is very, very elaborately done. It has, it's one, two, three layered, basically. And then it has a definition of the buckles or the little buttons on the front of it and on the sides of it. And when you turn him around and you see his face, you tell me if that's not a handsome, wonderful face. Beautiful artistic painting. The definition of his hands. Look at the look at the um, the veins in his hands and the um, the knuckles and the definition of them. Very beautifully done. No one has ever done a complete study of the painted boots on these dolls, but I I have kind of as I've gone along cataloging, I've come to recognize, and I haven't put it all together, but I really wish I could have the time to do that. Uh, which models would have the same style of boot, the same painted boot. That wouldn't necessarily attribute all of the things to being to one atelier um, because it may just simply be that boots were bought from this studio and various people bought them. But it is interesting to see all of the different styles. One of the ones I love, and I, I hope I find one here to show you, are some were made not with neatly arranged stockings like this, but with wrinkled stockings or the stockings falling down and all crumpled and all. And I thought that was a very realistic thing to go. I hope my enthusiasm is coming across to you because I just have loved working with these dolls so much. I had my first introduction to the Neapolitan dolls about 10 years ago when I was on a visit to Munich and I had a day, a day off from packing a collection. And I went to the Bayerisch National Museum and they were, because they had, been talking about an exhibition of ladies' purses that I wanted to see. 
And then I saw a little sign directing me down to the lower floor. And it was, I thought there'd be, oh, listen, maybe some nice early wooden dolls down there. Well, I was blown away. And if any of you ever go to Munich, you must go to this museum. It's an entire floor filled with the Neapolitan dolls. And they have Neapolitan, wooden, Bavarian, all of the dolls that were being made during this time period. And they put them in their original settings and they're extraordinary to see. And I walked out of there with about 15 books, unfortunately all in German, which I can't read, but I had enjoyed over the years seeing the photographs. And when I finally had the privilege of working on this collection, I said, I feel like I'm living in my own museum here for the short time the dolls are in our studios working on them. And I hope that many of you will get a chance to have a few of these, at least in your collection at home, because I mean it, you will come to love them because their faces are so distinctive, so unique, each one of them. Here is the Lemon Lady. She is really quite lovely. I'm gonna turn her around so you can see, you've gotta look at all of these hairstyles and tell me, do you not see the German bisque dolls being made some 100 years later with their sculpted hair? various ornate hairstyles, because that's what we have here. And see how their faces are always posed in some um, way that really corresponds to the, to the vision that the artist was trying to create. And she is, um, has, again, her posable arms. If you didn't want her arm extended, you could have it down straight. You could have her waving to someone. You could have her enclosing a child standing next to her. Um, I always find them I find them very appealing when they're holding an object as she is, her basket of lemons. And in the auction also, because this was a corollary industry that grew up, was the production of the miniature accessories that went with these figures. And it, there are many of them in this auction. For example, there are baskets of like melons and fruit, and it was designed um, for the, um, f to be presented with the dolls. Um, there's an entire uh, grocery store of meats, a butcher shop, with hand-carved wooden meats, wonderful things like that, that really kind of fed into the whole scene of the doll. So that is the very lemon lady with her beautiful, beautiful face. Now here's a handsome gentleman. And again, I, I'm trying to show you a variety of them because as I said, even though there are some that you, at first glance you think, oh, that reminds me of so-and-so, another one, but they're not, every one is different. And look at him, he has the greatest hair. Okay, look, he's just got a little tuft of hair at the front of his forehead, and then he's got a bald pate, and then he's got the sculpted hair around the back and the sides, with little wisps of curls coming out at the sides. He has this very angular face, which kind of goes along with it, but I just love that little forelock curl coming down like that. And he's dressed in really the like an aristocratic salon of the 1700s. Very, very famous gentleman. During this time, also remember other doll production that's going on. In France, you have the French court dolls that were being made that represented the same time period in the mid to late 1700s, represented different royalty of the court. In English, you have many of your beautiful English wooden dolls that were being created. and many of them designed to be put into these same kind of settings that the Neapolitan dolls were, were put into. So whereas we as doll collectors in our doll industry have tended not to pay attention to these dolls before, I think it's time we start doing that and see where they fall within the whole chronology of doll collecting. Look at this wonderful woman. Okay, when I'm cataloging dolls, I always go out of my way to point out if they have um, an impressed dimple in the cheek because that's just like this extra little bit of sculpting that had to go into something. And look at her. She's not just smiling sort of shyly, but she actually has little impressed dimples in her cheek. A wonderful, wonderful feature to have. And again, beautiful sculpting of the hair. Let's turn her around so you can see her face from all different views. Lovely jewelry I can see as she's coming around here too and she has a molded bosom. I don't like to keep particularly mentioning that, except that I tended to think the ones that have the molded bosom, that means that their shoulder plate was made down further and they probably were a more luxury doll and that was an added bonus feature of the doll. It's quite pretty. This fellow I love. And the wonderful thing about my job, 
particularly in these times when I can't go anywhere or do anything, is I get so many new things I can learn every day. So I spent, I really have to tell you, I spent one Saturday for two hours doing a study of the names of different mustaches. So I was able to, because I was determined to find what his mustache is called. And again, uh, if you go over all of these dolls, you're going to find uh, men with mustaches. And there are like five or six different styles of mustaches. So all these little details um, add to the description of it. And I want to show you. I read somewhere that there was, I learned a lot about Naples too, that there was, despite their interest in ethnography and other cultures, there was a royal edict at the time that anyone coming in from Asia, any of the men, were required to shave their heads with just a tuft of hair at the back or at the crown. And you'll see that runs consistently on them. And that was in order that they could be identified to the women of Naples as being an infidel. So that's not a nice thing to know, but it's history and it's important we know those things. What a great face on this fellow. Could you see the back of his head? And the profile, and look at the profile of his face. He's definitely a prince. At the beginning, I was showing you all of the ladies with sculpted hair, and there, see their like, sculpted caps, and I missed this one. She was sitting in a little corner over here. She has a beautiful sculpted cap because they have added details of the ruffling around it, and it's rimmed with a black bow, a black banding around it, and then a little bow at the top of her head. Very, very beautiful, perfectly matching her wonderful folklore costume, and again, a great face and you pose her as you wish. I love this man. I want to sit down and discuss some great work of literature with him because I just know he's this great scholar and philosopher and he would have some important things to tell me. And he's, again, look at his hairstyle. Even the men have different hairstyles. So he has the, like the balding crown, but then his hair at the sides and the back is pretty wild. Can you see his face? It's just great. This fellow, on the other hand, I don't know. Don't mess with him is what I want to say. I mean, you can look at every one of these and you can make a story about every one of these figures. But what I do like about him, he comes with his little barrel and his uh, wheelbarrow and his tub. and. Very often you will find them with their, um, with their flannel jacket and their satchel. And his cap is actually attached to his head, which is quite interesting. But very, very realistic features on him. I think he's a really interesting one. He appears early in the, in the auction. Now let me see what else did I not show you from this group. As I said, there's no order to these. I'm just simply showing you pieces that I really, I enjoyed working with. I thought she was very beautiful. She's lot number two in the catalog. And those of you who collect fashion dolls, for example, what a wonderful addition to your fashion doll collection because she fits in beautifully with any of the accessories from, um, from the, like the lady doll period uh, with her dressing tables, her tables with porcelains and pieces like that. And they're just grand. She has a beautiful complexion. And look at her wonderful style of her costume all the way around. She's less, um, she's more classic than many of the other pieces I'm showing here today. But when you want just one perhaps in your collection and you say, I want something that fits in with my other dolls, this might be the choice that you would make. Or for beautiful women, you might make this choice with a really extraordinary costume. Now I have to tell you that what is wonderful is that under this crown on her head, her hair, which is a, I, I know, although I haven't taken this off, so I don't definitely know, but it is a wonderfully sculpted hair. You can see the beginning of it here, her downward look, and she's holding, kind of hold, falls off her hand unless you get it posed on there. We have her holding this beautiful silver crown and that she's contemplating whether she's going to wear it or put it on a little 
child or what, I don't know. And she has this other wonderful accessory. All of these dolls have these wonderful silver accessories. And that's, they're just really grand. They're early and they're good pieces. She's a great face. And then one other of the children that I think has a particularly lovely face is this little girl. And sometimes what I think what appeals to me is the way their hair is arranged. And when I turn it around, look at how the curls are not just coming straight down in her back, but it's like they always have this sort of rumpled or windblown kind of look. And I find that very, very charming. Now, I'm defying you by asking you as we go along, have you seen any two that are alike? And if you have, you let me know, because I think you have not. I'm going to show you another group in a minute.